Hey guys, Super Horror Bro Mike here, and in today's video, it's time to go on a repair job at a local TV station full of crazed mascot puppets, as we explore the story and endings of My Friendly Neighborhood. So sit back, relax, and let's journey into this decidedly unfriendly neighborhood. Before we begin to tackle the story of central protagonist Gordon and his journey through the abandoned TV studio, we must first learn about the My Friendly Neighborhood show and why it was eventually cancelled and the studio closed. This information is revealed to the player through a series of notes and newspaper articles found throughout the game. These documents not only explore the show's history, but also a fictional war happening to the North at the same time, as well as shedding light on events unfolding within the city around the studio. My Friendly Neighborhood was originally made for public access television, and titled Ricky with Friends. It was the creation of Al Gerswald, who aimed to create a show that would bring joy to children, but also teach them valuable life lessons. After its success on public access, the show was picked up by the City Network Broadcasting Group, and its title changed to the one we now know. Production took place in the City Network Hotel, and the first episode aired on November 9th, 1968. It was an instant hit with children drawn to the lovable neighbours and their idealistic world. A series of movies followed, as well as hundreds of episodes over the next decade. Now at this point it is worth noting where My Friendly Neighborhood differs from most other mascot horror games. Rather than these puppets being rogue animatronics or brought to life by human souls via twisted inhumane experimentation, these mascots are simply alive. Just as characters within Jim Henson's Sesame Street or The Muppets are. The world of My Friendly Neighborhood is not based in our reality. It is set in a completely fictional universe where it seems puppets simply exist alongside humans. However, as you will see later in the story, these puppets are far more innocent than their human counterparts, and easily manipulated by their surroundings. Sometimes for the worse. While MFN was popular for many years, it eventually met its downfall. This all started as a result of a war waging on the northern continent. This war lasted for 20 years and claimed almost 100,000 casualties, finally ending on February 4th, 1972. While never named as such, this war is a very obvious parallel to the Vietnam War. This was the first war to be televised and, just like the Vietnam War, the repercussions of this changed the television landscape as a result. Moving further and further away from more innocent family-friendly output, and more and more towards grittier, more adult content. Audiences became jaded and conditioned by the graphic imagery appearing on their screens during wartime, and wanted programming to reflect that. By the early 1980s, a shift had occurred, with programming moving towards crime and drama shows which better appealed to the generation of children who grew up during the televised war. A wholesome show like My Friendly Neighborhood no longer fit in, and so the City Network Broadcasting Group instructed Al Gerswald to change the tone of MFN and reimagine the core principles of the series. It was also around this time that the city had gone through a massive economic downturn, and as a result was being brought up by business tycoon Ronald Rickborker and his company Nebuzaradan Enterprises evicting many citizens from their homes as he strove to create a city that could withstand the future by placing profits ahead of the well-being of consumers. This led to people of the city feeling more and more alienated and alone. There was a feeling of hopelessness and depression. The city became a dark and hostile place. My Friendly Neighborhood struggled to keep up with the new format of televised broadcasting, which favoured pessimism over optimism. A scandal had also happened on the set, where one of the puppets, Ray, had attacked the show's lead human actor, Richie Bromley, who later called the puppet stars crazy. This led Richie to quit, and so the show lost its leading man. This, coupled with a series of failures at the box office and a lack of interest in the show due to a jaded post-war generation of viewers, led to its cancellation on July 15th, 1983. Creator Al Gerswald gave a final recorded address to his young viewers in which he sounded defeated and sad. He ended by stating that while darkness exists in the heart of every human, there is also light. 
Al urged his viewers to try and find the light and see the best in humanity. This message was always the point of My Friendly Neighbourhood. It sought to give hope to the next generation. With the cancellation of the show, it seems the city finally lost its last bastion of light and plunged into darkness. And that is where our story begins. Fast forward to July 8th, 1993. The studio had been vacated for nearly a decade. However, one night the antenna begins broadcasting classic episodes of My Friendly Neighborhood over the nightly news. Gordon O'Brien, a local repairman, is sent out to turn off the antenna at the top of the City Network Broadcasting Group Hotel. We can tell from this work order that Gordon has a problem with authority and seems to dislike his job. He is currently on his final warning at work. Disable the antenna? Oh, the last job of the day is always the worst. Gordon enters the hotel lobby and heads to the elevator, which will take him up to the roof so he can shut off the antenna. However, the elevator door is stuck together by a sticky, jam-like substance. With no other options, Gordon rings the bell at the reception desk and waits for assistance. Rather than being greeted by a fellow human, he is instead met by Ricky, a sock puppet who is one of the main stars of the MFN show. I I'm here to disconnect the antenna. I am Ricky the Sock. Your television will never be the same. We- hold on, did you say disconnect the antenna? Yes. Oh my, no, 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 no. You mustn't do that. That would be a catastrophe. It's broadcasting over the news. The news? No, no, trust me. The antenna is just fine as it is. Doesn't need any disconnecting. Ricky tries his best to dissuade Gordon from shutting down the broadcast. While the two argue, Ricky hacks up a keycard before disappearing back into the hole he emerged from. Keycard in hand, Gordon heads over to Stage 4 in search of an alternate route to the antenna. Stage 4 is home to many of the puppet stars of My Friendly Neighborhood. There's Norman, Junebug, Leonard, Liliana, and George. Each have their own personality and distinctive features. However, as these puppets have gone so long without stimulation and meaningful human interaction, they have turned crazy, endlessly reciting jumbled lines from the show's episodes. When you go to the park, bring some food for all the wild animals. For birds, you can bring sunflower seeds. For squirrels, you can bring peanuts. For dogs, you can bring squirrels. For the ambient environment, you can bring a punk rock band that practices in your neighbor's backyard shed. And for me, your bestest friend, you can, you can just bring a friend. All, all I need is, is a friend. In fact, the further into the story we get, the more we learn about how these puppets require constant human interaction to prevent them from getting out of hand. Just like people, they require love and attention in order to fully function. These mascots rush Gordon on sight, arms outstretched, ready to attack. Though these attacks seem to be more excitable attempts at interaction rather than malicious acts of violence. The puppets are simply excited to finally see a human once more, and perhaps slightly bitter at being abandoned by their creator. Gordon locates a gun known as the Stenographer in the dressing room of MFN star Richie Bromley. This pistol-like gun fires off letters of the alphabet from a roller dexter, which helps Gordon take down his puppet assailant with ease. The guns Gordon locates throughout his adventure were designed by an inventor called Hank. He made these non-lethal weapons for security purposes, special effects, and fun. Though their use on the puppets may have resulted in some unintended side effects, such as the aggression they now display. Ricky shows up to try and take the gun from Gordon, but fails. Oh my, that's where I left that. I was looking for it all over the place. Ugh, fine. Eventually, Gordon gains a circular key which allows him to access the old city set. Here, he meets another mascot of the show, a giant bird named Pearl. Pearl is missing her eyes and, as a result, aimlessly stumbles about the set, posing a great danger to those around her who she tramples underfoot. While exploring the set, Gordon locates a pair of glasses, which he is then able to place atop Pearl's beak so that she can finally see once again. Helping out this giant bird calmed her nerves. 
she finally sees her reflection in the mirror after so many years of darkness. That's a good girl. There we go. Stay nice and calm. It's been a long time since you saw yourself, huh? It happens to all of us. We all get shocked sometimes when we look in the mirror. Oh, sorry. Sorry. By completing a puzzle involving alphabet blocks, Gordon retrieves a letter which he can then mail in exchange for a crank handle. Heading back outside, Gordon is now able to crank open a manhole and enter the sewers where Handyman Ray resides. Ray is a grumpy and sometimes heavy-handed repairman who failed to keep the sewers working properly. The water flow jammed up and the entire place began filling up with trash. He now lurks in various sewer ducts waiting for the opportune moment to jump out on an unsuspecting Gordon as he passes by. However, as a fellow repairman, Gordon is able to solve Ray's sewer trouble by fitting a new pump valve onto the filtration unit. This calms Ray's anger and returns him to his former friendly self. What do you want? Fix. Yeah, I fixed it. I'll fix. I, I, I just, look, when, when you've got a problem, you can't just clam up and start hitting everything with a wrench. That won't fix anything. Well, I'm going now. With Ray now calmed, Gordon is able to continue on, exploring the sewers until he locates a pair of bolt cutters which allow him to gain entry to a previously locked stairwell leading to an elevator which takes him to the offices above. Gordon also locates a handy new weapon known as the Novelist, a shotgun which fires off book pages at any puppets who pose a threat. Now in the offices, Gordon is able to continue his search for an alternate route up to the antenna. The offices are vast and full of puzzles for Gordon to solve, though we won't be covering those in this video, as if you are interested in seeing all the finer details of my friendly neighbourhood, I already have a full playthrough up on the channel for your viewing pleasure. Within the office resides a handful of new puppet frets. First are a gang of free hand puppets who gleefully leap between floors and walls as they wail at Gordon in high-pitched voices and attempt to latch onto him. The second and far more dangerous threat comes in the form of a giant frog-like puppet known as Goblet. She rushes from room to room like an enormous felt wrecking ball and demolishes anything in her path. Gordon locates a projection room and by playing various film reels on these projectors, notices that the puppets have been watching these movies and have become influenced by them. For example, when Goblet is shown a documentary of a war, she becomes depressed and sorrowful. This explains why many of her puppets act the way they do. While the show was still in production, they were shielded from the realities of the outside world. But left to their own devices, they began consuming media which changed their perception of reality, introducing themes such as loss, violence and hatred. Gordon heads down to the theatre where he consoles a downbeat goblet. Life can get you down sometimes, huh? First time I ever saw a movie as a kid, there was this scene of a man riding into this big blazing sunset and I remember when it came up, it just caught me. I don't know if it was the plot or the music or what, but my heart just suddenly leapt like, like I had just heard an old friend calling my name. Gordon explains how he lost a piece of himself during the war, but sitting down in the theatre with Goblet reminds him of the joy he first experienced as a child watching a movie for the very first time. While darkness exists in all forms of media, so does light, and this is a reminder for both that where there is sorrow it is always possible to find joy. This calms Goblet, removing her fury and replacing it with a peaceful acceptance. It seems these puppets simply require a human touch to remind them of who they once were. A little humanity, if you will. Gordon eventually manages to locate a key that unlocks the door to the office building. However, as he heads for the exit, he is ambushed by a giant puppet known as Curtain Call. 
Gordon must use his newfound weapon, a hand grenade that fires out letters dubbed the Punctuation, to take down the ferocious fabric. With Curtain Call now vanquished, Gordon is able to exit the offices and gain access to the park using a set of newly acquired keys. After entering the park and navigating its maze, Gordon runs into Ricky once again, who urges him not to shut down the antenna and also berates him for his violent, gung-ho attitude towards the puppets. I'm just doing my job. Uh-huh, sure. I take it blasting your way through hordes of allegedly psychopathic puppets is a normal day at work for you, hmm? Seriously, Gordon, who hurt you? I don't know what you're talking about. No? So you were just born a bully? I'm not a bully! Surprised you're not a detective. They're always bashing down doors and brandishing guns. Or maybe a GI give you a chance to rampage through some small defense. Don't say that, Ricky. Say what? Don't talk about the war. Why not? Just saying. Seems like exactly the sort of place you- <laughs> This likening to a soldier during wartime brings back some ugly memories from Gordon's past. He has struggled to move on from the horrors he experienced while fighting on the northern continent. An experience which left him lonely and angry at the world as a result. At the other side of a park, Gordon discovers a garden area with a greenhouse, and within this greenhouse a mixing machine capable of creating a solvent which will allow him to dissolve the jam sticking at the elevator leading to the antenna. In order to mix up the chemical concoction, Gordon must backtrack through the various areas of the studio to locate three different compounds. While doing so, he runs into a group of puppet dogs. Ferocious hounds who pounce him on sight. To calm these puppets, Gordon must locate two halves of a medallion, which grants him access to an aviary, and beyond this building, a courtyard where a bag of kibble sits atop a bench. Returning to the greenhouse area where the dogs reside, Gordon pours the food into their bowls and rings the dinner bell. This satiating the poor pup's hunger and turning them from vicious killing machines into placid pets. See, you're not so bad after all. After locating the three compounds and mixing up the solvent, Gordon returns to the hotel lobby and unjams the elevator door. Riding it up, he now finds himself in the aptly named Cardboard Penthouse, where the walls and floors are made from crayon covered card. By locating pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and placing them down on a power plate, Gordon is able to restore light to a musical stage, where he meets a piano playing puppet called Moraine. This grouchy out of tune musician requests Gordon to play a duet with him on the keys. Play duet! I can't read music. <coughs> Get off me, you. <coughs> <coughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, um. Sounds good, buddy. I'm going to go now, okay? Doing so allows Gordon to help out the final puppet in need and restore peace and harmony to the protagonists of the show. With each puppet now calmed, he is able to ride the platform to the roof and climb to the top of the antenna to finally shut down the broadcast. While doing so, Gordon is greeted by Ricky, who once again urges him to reconsider. I don't want you broadcasting, Ricky. You're going to hurt kids. Hurt them? Gordon, we want to help them. They need us. You need us. For what? For what? Gordon, look at this city. The buildings are dark and the streets are empty. No one knows how to be a friendly neighbor. It's a city of shuttered up hearts and they need someone to let in the light. I don't think that's you. Ricky explains that by broadcasting the show, the puppets are simply trying to help out the city and its children. They wish to return some light and hopefulness to this dull, hostile world. 
Gordon ignores his plea and shuts off the broadcast. But just as he does so, a bolt of lightning strikes the antenna and sends him hurtling into the depths of the studio. Gordon luckily lands on a bag of trash which breaks his fall, yet he finds himself in the abandoned set beneath the studio. Here he encounters a group of deranged puppets who have evolved into vengeful entities as a result of watching the wrong kinds of shows. Ricky calls Gordon up on the phone and explains that after the MFN show was closed down and the studio abandoned, the puppets sought to find out why, and so began watching other TV shows. They had never been allowed before, and for good reason. Watching these more violent shows twisted their minds and turned some of them into hateful creatures. We'd never been allowed to watch television before, but after we got cancelled, no one was around to stop us. Okay. So we turned on one of the old sets, expecting to see something amazing. But it wasn't amazing. It was... mean. It felt like we were dying, Gordon. We all got a little twisted then, but some of us... Great. Then how do I get out of here? Well, there's... Uh, th th there's an elevator somewhere. Uh, should be at the end of that hall? It said it's locked down. Oh, that means you'll have to pull the security release. That's on the other side of their stage. No, of course it is. Gordon picks up a flashlight and searches for an exit in the depths of the old set. He narrowly escapes a horde of bad puppets, and then runs into a terrifying creation known as the Amalgamation. A horrifying selection of various puppet parts fused together, which he manages to fight and eventually take down. Returning to the surface, Gordon leaves the hotel and encounters Ricky outside. Gordon! You're alive! I'm so proud! Good. I'm leaving. Yes, you should! Job well done, Gordon! Turned off our antenna and survived the unfriendly neighborhood! You're a handy man extraordinaire! It is here where the player can select one of three endings. Let's take a look at each in turn. Before we get to the three main endings, there is in fact a secret fourth ending which can be unlocked at any point during the game by simply climbing back into Gordon's repair van and leaving the job unfinished. You know, I could just leave now. The next day I got called into the office, cause the network wasn't happy. Wanted to know why I hadn't finished the job. After a big long fight, I got fired. I'm fine with that. I'd rather be unemployed than have to go back there. But for the next few months, I actually started watching the nightly news. I don't know why, maybe I just wanted to see what happened. But nothing happened. Then at some point I got distracted and forgot about it. Ricky offers Gordon a choice to either stay and help out the puppets in their quest to return My Friendly Neighborhood to television screens, or decline his offer and simply walk away. If Gordon should choose to turn down Ricky, then the following bad ending plays out, in which the show continues to fade from memory, and Gordon continues to live a lonely and unfulfilling existence. After I got back to the office, my boss told me that everyone was really happy with what I did, even though the puppets messed up another night's news. I got promoted to manager, got an office with a window. But for some reason, I can't stop thinking about the neighborhood. For the next few months, I actually started watching the nightly news. Don't know why. Maybe I just wanted to see if something happened. But nothing happened. And at some point, I got distracted and forgot about it.
If we accept Ricky's offer to stay at the studio and help bring back the show, but have not helped out each of the puppets in need during Gordon's journey through the studio, then we unlock a neutral ending. In this ending, the show comes back and is successful, but Gordon eventually stops working on it and moves on with his life, a decision he later regrets, as he continues to live a life without purpose. I helped the neighbors get a slot on public access TV. It was late night on weekdays, I don't think anyone watched it. Within a couple of weeks though, word was starting to get out. Some people loved the show, some people hated it. That caught the network's attention, and by the end of the year, we had three channels wanting to sign for a whole season. At that point, I figured I had done my part, so I stopped showing up at the studio in the evenings. I don't know, I guess I just wanted to keep my head down. I never told anyone I was helping bring back the show, but for some reason it keeps bugging me. I can't forget about it. And some nights, I catch myself staring out the window, wondering what's happening in the neighborhood. Finally, we have the good ending. This is unlocked by choosing to stay at the studio and helping out each of the five puppets along the way. In this ending, Gordon not only brings back the show, but continues to work on it. He loses his repairman job, but doesn't care, because in helping out the neighborhood, he has restored a little hope to the city, as well as finally finding a place in society where he feels he belongs. Fine, we'll give it a shot. Oh, Gordon, I'm so glad. We will have such fun! I'm not living here, though. Well, we'll talk about that. Oh, Gordon, thank you. Thank you for being our friend. I am bursting at the seams. I must go tell the others at once. Tomorrow night, then? Uh, no, 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 it's no. It's decided. Tomorrow night. See you later, Gordon. Arrivederci. Toodaloo. 23 skidoo. Ciao. Well, Brian, what have you done this time? I helped the neighbors get a slot on public access TV. It was late night on weekdays, I don't think anyone watched it. Within a couple of weeks though, word was starting to get out. Some people loved the show, some people hated it. That caught the network's attention. And by the end of the year, we had three channels wanting to sign for a whole season. Of course, after my boss found out I was involved, I got fired. But somehow, I feel a little hopeful about it. It's hard to describe. It's like you've been lost in a tunnel until suddenly a voice calls your name. And you turn around and you see the rising sun. And it's so bright, maybe it hurts a little to look at. But you don't care because it's leading you home. And with that, we come to the end of this video and a look at the story and endings of My Friendly Neighborhood. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it both entertaining and informative. If you did, then remember to leave a like, comment down below, and of course subscribe for more horror-related content. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next video.